Some people are prejudiced on some things but not others. For example, a racist is not necessarily a sexist and vice versa. But at the same time, even if someone's racist, why might they be racist against some groups of people but not others? Why might an American hate the British but not the French? Also like just why? What's prejudice? Can anyone be prejudiced? What causes it? Why are some people so extreme? Alright, calm down. Today's mental ration is about all these things and more. Also, yes, yes, we're all prejudiced is what I will conclude. Let's get the basics out of the way first. You are currently a member of an infinite number of social groups. Your gender, your ethnicity, your race, even what football team you support are some examples of social groups. If you're a white German accountant, anything that may be offensive to white people, Germans or accountants might also offend you. This is because you identify with your social groups. They are your social identities. These identities exist at multiple levels as well, not just multiple forms. A French person can rile up a German by saying something bad about Germany like gherkins are better than sauerkraut, but a German can offend another German if they focus on the city level identity instead. For example, if a dude from Munich attacks the quality of beer in Dusseldorf. Social identities are quite literally infinite. You can draw a social identity from things as small as whether you've got tattoos or not, what kind of car you drive, or even your hair color. This might sound ridiculous, but if you don't believe me, find a blonde and make a stereotypical joke about blonde's intelligence. Then come back to me. I've got some painkillers right here. Hold on. Hold on, these are for period pain. What, what are they doing in my house? But not all social identities are equally important all the time. For our German accountant, his accountant identity will be most important when he's at work. However, his German identity might be more pronounced in discussions about cultures across the world. Why is this important? Well, because pretty much everything in social psychology ever is based on this idea. The fact that at any moment in our head, we have a conception of an in-group, which is the social group we are part of, and all the out-groups, the social groups we are not part of, all based on whatever is highlighted at the moment. This is why things like propaganda work so well, but before we get to explaining that, we need to get a grasp on decades of research which have shown that we think about in-groups in fundamentally different ways than out-groups. Ultimate attribution error. That's the bread and butter of prejudice because it describes how we validate our own groups and invalidate other groups. It basically means that we tend to think in-group members do good stuff because they're good people and bad stuff because they're caught up in a bad situation, but out-group members do bad stuff because they're horrible people and only do good stuff when the stars are aligned or something. This happens in various ways. For example, immoral acts by outgroup people are blamed on the outgroup person being of immoral character, whereas immoral acts by in-group people are attributed to them finding themselves in a tough place. For example, when researchers showed white participants a video of a black person pushing a white person, the participants attributed this behavior to the black person being violent. When it was a white person doing the pushing, however, the participants instead attributed the push to situational factors such as the heat of the moment. What's more, they seem to describe the push as more violent when a black person was doing it. We also tend to think inequalities exist because of personality traits of group members when it's our group on top. But we tend to think it's due to tough situations when our group is the one on the receiving end. For example, whereas nearly all black people attribute the relatively higher proportion of arrests made against black people to discrimination in policing, white people are much more likely to put this down to black people just being troublemakers. Now, that's not to say every white person thinks this way. In fact, most do recognize the role of discriminatory policing in this. It's just that you're much more likely to find a white person that ignores this than a black person. You could say it's not that uh, <clears throat> black and white. <laughs> Please don't unsubscribe. Another huge group bias that we have is outgroup homogeneity. We use behaviors of in-group members to judge the person carrying out the behavior, but we use the same behavior by an outgroup member to make a judgment about their entire group. So for example, 
If you're an American and see another American berating a waiter, you're likely to think to yourself, my god, what a... But if you see, say, a French person doing the same thing, you might think something like, wow, the French sure are rude. This probably happens because we have much less experience with people from outgroups, so we tend to generalize from very little. See, this thing called homophily makes us surround ourselves with people who are similar to us, so we kind of block ourselves from meeting people who are different. In fact, one of the most important prejudice theorists of the 20th century, Gordon Allport, suggested that if you increase the amount of positive contact that groups have, this will also reduce the prejudice between them. He was probably right. Brexit data shows that it was actually the areas in Britain that suffered the least from immigration which predominantly voted to leave the European Union. And there is research to suggest this was due to more positive contact between Europeans and the British which led to lower prejudice in the higher immigration areas. Now let's explain why we could be prejudiced against some groups but not others. It boils down to who is competing against our group for resources. Now I use the term resources loosely. It could be anything from material resources to political credibility to which country has the strongest tech industry. Two big countries like the US and China will often go head to head over things like this and therefore the conflict and by extension prejudice between the two will be more at the forefront. On the other hand, you rarely hear about the US clashing with, I don't know, Malta over who's got the better smartphone company, mainly because Malta doesn't actually have any. So Americans generally don't have strong feelings on the Maltese. This also explains why fans of big football clubs usually clash with fans of other big football clubs while the smaller clubs are generally left unbothered. Smaller clubs pose less of a threat to the big team's title claims. What I just described is known as realistic conflict theory. The study which gave rise to it, now widely known as the robber's cave experiment, got two groups of boys to camp at a boy scout site. After a couple days of initial acclimation, the researchers had the boys compete against each other in games like tug of war. Winning a game got the winners a reward, while the losers would get uh, <clears throat> nothing. Basically, one group's goals were directly opposed to the others. Over the period during which these challenges were held, each group began developing very negative attitudes towards each other, leading into aggressions such as fistfights or raiding each other's cabins. Like, th these boys were savage. After the games period, the study moved into a cooperation phase. The researchers staged camp-wide problems such as disruptions to the water tank supply, which both groups had to work together to resolve. Over this period, the boys started to become, and eventually became, friends. Turning resource conflict into cooperation can remove the prejudice as well, but this is much harder in real life. Basically, yeah, countries act like teenage boys. Now you might ask, really? Do you really need to be in competition with another group before you get to hate them? That is healthy skepticism, my imaginary friend that I just produced for purposes of flow. Indeed, this is not the case. See, in the world of humans, everything is relative. If I have $5 and you have $1, I am rich. The moment I find a person with $10, I am poor, although I haven't actually lost any money myself. Haven't gained any lately anyway. This is the idea behind relative deprivation. Groups will tend to fixate not just on the amount of resources they have, but also how much or how little they have in comparison to other groups. Now again, this isn't just about money or physical things. It could well be about social treatment. If you're an ethnic minority who's treated mm, okay, that treatment will be unacceptable to you if you witness another person from the majority ethnic group receiving better treatment. Since you've witnessed the other group receiving such good treatment, you know it is possible for you to receive it as well. And you therefore feel deprived if you don't. Watch this Ross Kemp clip where he's interviewing gangsters in New Orleans. Why do you think it is so violent? Why is it so violent in New Orleans? It, man, it's violent because they don't want to give a no job, you hear me? They look at a nigga, they like, you a hoodlum, you hear me? So if you don't want to give it to me, you hear me? And I'm trying to do the right thing, you hear me? Well, fuck it, look, I got to go take it, you hear me? Fuck it, you hear me? What about, what about the, um, the police force? Nani? 
Funnily enough, this clip was doing the rounds to justify the disproportional black arrest rates, but at least from a psychological viewpoint, this clip says more about the gangsters' environment than it says about them as people. Of course, you know me, I won't rely on anecdotal evidence alone. A group of researchers, including academics from Harvard and Yale, showed that Muslim people born in the West may be more prone to endorsing extremism than those born in the East. This is because witnessing their own treatment against the treatment of majority groups in the West, Western Muslims experience more deprivation. For someone who doesn't understand the role of relative deprivation in this and may tend to ignore the injustice, they won't just think all Muslim people are extremists, although it's clear it's something else causing the issue since changing the context to an Eastern one changes the story. It's the same thing with racism. A paper by Harvard researchers basically found exactly what the man in the Ross Kemp clip was saying. Crime is consistently found to be higher in areas experiencing higher income inequality. It's basically a loop. And inequality causes relative deprivation, which may drive antisocial behavior on the part of the marginalized group. This behavior can then reinforce the idea that this group is inherently bad, which increases the inequality and so on. Of course, relative deprivation can also be seen on the part of majority groups. It's not just about what's really there, but also largely what is in the eye of the beholder. Many natives of European countries coming from poorer status often feel left out by their country's political system. Observing help received by immigrants in their countries, for example subsidies or jobs, can drive the false perception that these immigrants are receiving more than locals. These natives will therefore also experience relative deprivation, which will often drive their anti-immigrant attitudes. Even extremist movements like white supremacism are fundamentally based on similar mechanisms. Ever noticed how almost everyone backing these movements seems to think that their race is being silenced on mainstream media? Write down the phrase relative deprivation and keep it in your pocket. It's a good term to remember. There's something very striking about groups' tendencies to think in relative terms. When you introduce some kind of split or mild division between them, it's very, very easy for them to lose the plot. You should sit down. I'm about to explain exactly what divide and rule means. It's possible to split people into groups on some arbitrary basis, and then get them to act in ways that can actually harm both groups, just as long as it harms the outgroup more than it harms the in-group. This is what's known as the minimal group paradigm in psychology. In a now classical study, a group of children were shown some paintings and then split into two groups supposedly based on what kind of art they liked more. In reality, this split was actually random. The children would be paid for their time, but they were told that how much they would be paid would depend on how many points they'd get in the study. How were points given to them? They were given to them by the other children. Each child had the option of giving a certain number of points to a random child in their own group and a random child in the other group. Although they were presented with options that were really good for both children, for example giving a child 13 points, the children actually behaved in ways that was worse for both groups but maximized the difference between them. For example, giving the in-group child 8 points and the out-group child 3 points. What's divide and rule again? Highlight some kind of, any kind of, non-shared identity between people, and from there it's very easy to get them to behave irrationally against each other. If you want to rule them, avoid becoming their common enemy. If you're a common enemy to both, they will become friends again and can turn against you in record speeds. I don't mean that literally, by the way, don't go around turning people against each other. I just mean like, beware of people's attempts to scapegoat others this way. What are you doing? What are you doing? Now, 
everyone can be prejudiced, just not on the same things. Remember what we said about social identities, some are more salient than others. So someone with a very strong national identity is much more likely to be prejudiced against immigrants than someone who doesn't care about their nationality as much. At the same time, someone who is politically active is very likely to stereotype members of their political opposition. Of course, the argument would be that they're not prejudiced if the other person has moral flaws in their thinking, but keep the fact that we're all naive realists in mind. Mind. We think that we view the world objectively and that anyone who disagrees with us suffers from some kind of genetic problem that just makes them be wrong all the time. Be wrong all the time, is that even grammatically correct? Ultimately, everyone holds the opinions they do because they believe they are right. There is probably a lot of credence in the flaws you can spot in other people's thinking, but remember, you won't spot the flaws in your own unless they're pointed out to you, so when they are, learn rather than get mad. Here's the thing, whenever you meet a person who might be of a different identity to you, the fact they have a different identity on that domain will probably only be made known to you when you're caught in an argument with them. You could, for example, be a political liberal who thinks all conservatives stew babies and eat them, or vice versa. The super polite cashier at your local supermarket or some of your online gaming buddies could all have opposite views to you, but you'd never know that because you don't get into political conversations with them. In fact, the one time you're likely to know that someone is politically opposed to you is… when you're arguing with them on Facebook or Reddit. Your idea of what the average person on the other side of the debate is like is going to be massively skewed. And I can prove that to you. How's he gonna do that? I think he's gonna cite more. Research. Recent research has found that people basically anchor the prejudice they display to political outgroups on how much they think these outgroups hate them. The problem is, on average, we think that an outgroup member dislikes us twice as much as they actually dislike us in reality. A lot of the prejudice we display towards outgroups is justified by this false perception that an outgroup detests us when they might just have a slight prejudice against us. Another piece of research coming out of Harvard found that when we correct these false perceptions by showing people actual data of the true perceptions of an outgroup towards us, we in turn also become less biased and prejudiced against them, because we realize they don't dislike us nearly as much as we think they do. To summarize, your moral code or personality will make you value some things over others. This will also define who is friend and who is foe to you. For every conflict between these in-group friends and out-group foes, your perception of the out-group worsens. Whenever you engage with an out-group will probably be a time when you're competing against them over something, like credibility in a political argument. This is because, unless we're talking about visible features like skin color, you're not going to know that other person is an out-group member unless it's brought up. And it's unlikely to get brought up unless you're fighting over it. So you think that every outgroup member is like that. Meanwhile, that other person is making the same judgments about your group. Interactions like this will make you overestimate how much the outgroup dislikes your own group and you'll end up thinking they hate you when they really don't. You will reciprocate this. Ta-da! Welcome to 21st century polarization. Just keep in mind the following. For every identity you don't share with another person, there is probably one you do share. Just because a conversation is fixated on something you disagree on doesn't mean this person is horrible, nor does it mean you're completely incompatible. Also, even if the other person is indeed horrible, don't be tempted to generalize this to every single person from that group. Imagine what it would be like if someone just thought you were stuck up before they even met you just because they met someone else from your country who also happened to be stuck up. Imagine if everybody thought that every single Scottish person in the world swears as much as Gordon Ramsay does. Yeah. Remember, outgroups don't dislike you nearly as much as you think they do. Talking things out works wonders, surprisingly. Just don't let things spiral, learn from others and also teach them stuff back. Thanks so much for watching. Like this video if you learned something new, hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of new content and comment with stuff you'd like to see next. Keep it classy and I'll see you next time.